Um, you can tweet with the hashtag PHPCE2017. Take some pictures. My boss will love it. I will talk about the IOC container, um, not just the IOC container, but I will give you a general overview of different features in different IOC containers. My name is Hannes, and I can describe myself with four emoji characters. I'm a Belgian, and I like the swim cycle run. I work for a company called Stream. Uh, Stream is a company based in Amsterdam, and we build um, a SaaS product for scalable feeds. So if you have uh, a user with a thousand followers and they post something, you might break your application unless you use Stream. If you use Stream, we handle that scalability for you. Uh, we have flat feeds, we have aggregation feeds, like 15 people liked your recent post, or uh, 13 people are attending an event near you, something Facebook-like. Um, we also have notification feeds, which can tell you, oh, you already have seen this notification, or you already have read that notification. We also have ranked feeds, and ranked feeds are um, basically like Facebook timelines. Uh, Facebook timeline is, is, is not historical, it's not chronological. So what is more interesting to you pops up more at the top of the, of the ranked feed. But that's enough about the sales pitch about Stream. Let's talk about something PHP specific. PHP has IOC containers. If you go to packages.org and you type in IOC or container, you can find a bunch of packages. Um, IOC stands for International Olympic Committee. No, that's, that's a joke, that's a joke. Uh, it stands for inversion of control. Um, and in order to understand inversion of control, we have to understand a couple of design patterns. I know, I know, you probably already know all the design patterns, but it's okay to refresh up the, the mind and to clear up some knowledge. Um, some design patterns. Um, let's star start off with a basic class. Uh, and we're going to refactor that uh, based on the customer's needs, and to, we are going to introduce some design patterns to improve this, uh, this class for uh, yeah, better, better maintainability for the customer's needs. So this simple service class does a couple of things, right? It gets some stuff from an FTP, um, from an FTP server, um, basically a file. It's going to read the file, do some calculations, and return the result. So the service has one method, calculate. So what we can do is we, uh, instead of newing up the FTP client here, is inject it through the constructor. So that's constructor injection. That's the first design pattern. So instead of newing up the FTP here, we do it somewhere else, and we say, hey, service, here's the FTP client you can use. Still, we do the, the three same things. We get a file from FTP, we do some calculations, and we turn the result. Um, the client comes in next week and says, well, uh, the site is running pretty slow. You're getting the same file from the FTP server all over and over again, so it's pretty slow. Can you do something about it? Yeah, sure. We go to the same service class, and we add a few lines of code to add some caching uh, to prevent the FTP, uh, to prevent this class to hit the FTP server over and over again. So now the class does four things. Get stuff from the FTP, does caching, do some calculations, return the result. The client comes in again. I want to know how, much, how often you hit this FTP server. OK, we add some logging to the same class. Now the class does five things. That's a bit much, no? The client comes in again and says, well, this FTP thing, we're going to move it. Ah, oh, damn, we're using this FTP thing in the constructor, we do it in the first item, we get some stuff, we uh, prevent the cache hitting, uh, we prevent the, the, the FTP from hitting it over and over again, we log it. So we have to refactor this entire class, which does five things. It's a bit too much, no? That's not really maintainable. OK, OK, this is just a small class, and it's probably 50 lines, 60 lines, not more. But still, we want to have single responsibility. So what we do is we take the FTP stuff out and move it to a different class. This class will be called FTP storage. And it will be a de dependency of the service class. So in this FTP storage, we get stuff, we cache it, we log it, and return the file. We just 
take everything uh, from the first few lines and extract it to a different class. That's the first step of refactoring. Um, so the, the FTP storage class has an FTP dependency. It just takes the FTP dependency from the service class, moves it to the FTP storage. Right now, we can refactor the service class to inject, to have this FTP storage injected in the constructor. So it has a different dependency now. What we can do next is, instead of injecting an FTP storage, we inject something more general, like a storage interfaced class. And the storage interfaced class can have a simple method, get. Whatever the implementation is, whatever is inside, we don't care. We just abstract it, use an interface, and inject that. So the FTP storage will implement that storage class. Whatever is in the get method, it doesn't matter. The service class doesn't matter whether it's cached or logged or whatever, or if, or if it's from FTP or an HTTP service or from Amazon S3. It doesn't matter. So that's the second refactor done. We implement according to interfaces, insta in abstractions instead of implementations. Ooh, sparkling water. Didn't expect that. Oops. Right. So what we can do next is refactor the FTP storage implementation. Because, OK, you, you have a different implementation, an S3 implementation of the storage, but you might want to cache that too. So instead of duplicating the few lines for caching the S3 storage stuff uh, and the FTP storage stuff, we can extract that to a decorator. And we can apply that dec decorator over every single type of storage class. So this storage uh, cache decorator will take any kind of storage class, whether it's an FTP storage class or, a, um, or an S3 storage class, or any other decorator. You see, we can create multiple decorators and wrap them with the same, uh, yeah, wrap them with other decorators. So what this does is basically uses the key, cache it for 30, 60 seconds, uh, and return the result. We can do the same thing for logging. We can create a log decorator, which takes another storage class um, this could be the FTP, the S3, the cache decorator, could be anything, because these decorators also implement storage. They have the same simple method, get key, return value. So right now we have greatly simplified the FTP storage class, as well as the S3 storage class. It just does one thing, gets a file from FTP and returns it. If you wrap this class with a cache decorator and a log decorator, you can prevent this class uh, from ever being hit. If it's being cached, the cache decor decorator will already return the result before you call the FTP storage. So to wrap up this first few um, design patterns, uh, dependency inversion is uh, pointing to the abstraction instead of the implementation. So the service class is going to um, depend on the storage in interface instead of on the FTP, uh, FTP storage class. Dependency injection is injecting any kind of storage class into the service class. The service class needs a dependency, so somehow the dependency will be um, used inside this service class. Inversion, is uh, inversion of control means you're not going to new up all those classes. The service class will be called, and you don't need to um, new up an FTP storage class from within the service class. Someone else will do that for you. So if you look at the dependency graph, it looks like this. The service class depends on an FTP storage class, and the FTP storage class depends on FTP. If we depend on the interface, it looks like this. The service depends on the storage interface, and FTP storage in implements the storage. 
and the FTP storage depends on the FTP. Note that every single arrow is pointing upwards. If your dependency graph is stable, you can, you can, uh, you can graph this entire graph, you can display this entire graph with only upward facing arrows. This means your class structure is stable. Um, of course, we can, we can uh, expand this with the FTP storage, the cache decorator, S3 storage, log decorator, and so on. They all implement storage. But service no longer depends on the lower level um, FTP storage. It depends on a higher level storage. You mean, I mean higher level, it means higher in the dependency graph. So what is IOC? If we need a new service class, you might be tempted to write this, new service, new FTP storage, new FTP. But I would like you to no longer do this, uh, but to start using IOC containers. IOC containers help you with building new objects. Um, this one simple line is a replacement for new, s new service class, new FTP, new, F uh, new FTP storage, new FTP. What this container get method will do is behind the scenes it will see uh, it will take a look at the service class and it will see oh this needs a storage interface object uh, how can i make a make a service interface object um, well i can create an ftp storage which is an implementation then i can wrap it with a log decorator to see how many times i i, I actually hit the ftp storage and then after that i can wrap it with a cache decorator and then after that i can inject that cache decorator instance which is wrapping all the other storage classes and inject it into the service class. This is a lot of things it can do, uh, but the container, the container object will do this for you and you will no longer have to uh, worry about this entire building of objects. So inversion of control, containers to the rescue. Um, an IOC container basically is here to help you with composition of difficult objects and decorators uh, and calling setter methods and constructor injection. So you no longer have to deal with that. IOC container will help you. If you go to packages.org, you can find a lot of IOC containers. Uh, the most popular ones are the, are the ones that come with uh, any kind of framework. Like Zend has one, Symfony has one, uh, Laravel has one. Laravel is called Illuminate. Uh, RRDI has one, Pimple is a simple one by, I think it's uh, Sensio Labs as well, and there's uh, the PHP League container as well. And most of them, but not, not all of them, they implement the container interop uh, interface. So there's a simple interface that's being put out there by a couple of people, and they call it the container interop container. Um, and recently, well, I think it's almost a year ago, uh, they made that into a formal uh, PSR 11. Um, PSR stands for PHP Standard Recommendation. It's a recommendation, so it's not a standard. You don't have to use it, but it's a recommendation, so it's free to use. Uh, use it whenever you like. So PSR 11 is basically exactly the same as Container Interop. Um, since Container Interop 1.2.0, it actually implements the PSR 11 container. So it's a super easy upgrade from container interop to PSR 11. Um, the container interop interface basically extends uh, the interface from PSR. Super simple. Um, so we're going to start using this container now. Um, and without configuring it, some containers can already help you with building some objects. Uh, this is autom called automatic object resolution. Different containers or different documentation sites use different names for this, uh, but I like to call it automatic object resolution. The, the thing is, uh, when you have a class like this, send invoice, this is basically uh, an event listener. It listens to an event and then it sends an invoice when the event is, is fired. So this send invoice requires a mailer. It, that's a dependency. It requires a mailer in, in the constructor using constructor injection to send off this invoice via email. So using automatic object resolution, 
the IOC container or some IOC container could take a look at the constructor and see, oh, it needs a mailer. I'm going to new up this send invoice listener and inject a mailer. So we can do container get inside the event listener, inside the event um, dispatcher. We can do container get send invoice listener. And this will return a listener object. And it will be automatically resolved um, with constructor injection. So using most containers, I like to uh, use uh, the PHP leak container. We can use something simple like this. New container, delegate to reflection container, and then that container will be automatically be set up, or it will be smart enough to detect that the send invoice class needs a mailer. And it will look at the mailer class and look at those dependencies, the dependencies of the mailer class, and inject those as well. And this will go on and on recursively until all dependencies are resolved. And to do this, most containers use reflection. The reflection API is um, a set of classes built into PHP. Every, every PHP installation has it. And a reflection class um, can, do, can take a class name, look at the constructor, and give you all parameters and those type hints. So by looking at the type hints, it can automatically find out what needs to be injected. When we look at the uh, send invoice class, we can see that this constructor has one uh, constructor argument, which is mailer. It will take a look at the mailer class, take a look at the constructor of the mailer class, look at all those parameters. And so on and on and on. It will recursively build all dependencies until all dependencies, all dependencies are ready and start injecting them all the way up the chain. Right. Um, some containers can do this, including the Symfony one, the Zend one, the Laravel one, and the Leak container one. So the major containers can all do this. But in some situations, well, in most situations, this doesn't really work. Container is not smart enough to figure out everything. Um, for example, some constructor arguments might not be type hinted could be a boolean, could be a, a string argument, um, could be an interface class, an interface type hint. So for example, m there's the logger interface, which is implemented by monolog. Um, and if you want to inject a logger interface object, the container basically says, well, I can't new up a uh, an interface. An interface doesn't have a constructor. That's uh, a basic rule. An interface doesn't have a constructor. You cannot new up an interface. You have to new up uh, an object, an implementation of the interface. So when an interface is type hinted, we want to tell the controller, uh, the container, sorry, we want to tell the container to use some class instead of that con interface. Um, one way to solve that is aliasing. We can alias an interface with an with a class name. In Symfony, it goes like this. We can set alias mailer interface use this mailer implementation. Could be PHP mailer, could be SendGrid mailer, could be whatever, SMTP. Uh, in Laravel, we can use container alias instead of set alias. And in leak, um, we can use some kind of a closure or an anonymous function, whatever you want to call it. And whenever this anonymous function is called, it will return or it should return a mailer interface object. So uh, in, in many different containers, we can use container add mailer interface and then give it an anonymous function, which will return the specific implementation of that mailer interface. It should. Otherwise, your setup is wrong. So that's how we, um, that's how we resolve interfaced objects when it's interfaced, uh, type hinted into a constructor argument. Situation two is when a class has a constructor which has non-type hinted constructor arguments. For example, um, you have a couple of booleans. Booleans cannot be type hinted. The container doesn't know what to inject there. Is it true? Is it false? It's not something that's resolvable. Um, the solution is to define the dependencies. 
Uh, in Symfony, we can do this. We can say container register mailer class add argument. We can add. Uh, we can call this add argument method a couple of times. Uh, the first argument could be a logger interfaced object. The second argument could be a boolean. The third argument could be uh, I don't know whatever something. Add argument. We can also make this. Uh, in, in Symfony is called a parameter, so we can bind those parameters to the container as well, and we can inject uh, registered parameters from the container. And Pimple, it goes like this. Um, Pimple is a, a very basic container, but it's good. It's super fast. Um, and we can use it in an array-typed uh, way. So we have array access on the container. We can do container set um, in an array kind of way, mailer interface is anonymous function. And whenever mailer interface is uh, resolved, it's going to execute this function and return the result of the function. The returned object from the function will be re the returned object from the container when you call a mailer interface uh, object. The third situation, when we need to help the container um, when a class is type hinted, um, always return the same object. So some containers have different ideas here. Uh, for example, when you um, when you call the Symfony container and you say container give me a mailer object, it will re always return you the, the mailer object with the exact same reference, right? Um, this is useful for keeping global state in, for example, a translator. Um, if, a, if you want to use uh, Polish throughout your entire site, you set up the translator and set the, uh, the language to Polish and keep that translator object throughout everywhere in your application where you inject a translator. You, exa you have exactly the same translator object throughout your entire application. You can use the same thing for views and sessions. Wherever you want to keep a global state and you want to share the same instance all over your application, you're going to uh, share that instance. Um, so sharing an instance is done in different ways. Um, in the PHP Lee container, it's called uh, container share. In Laravel, it's called container singleton. But it's basically the same idea. Um, when you want to share the entity manager interface object, you always get the exact same doctrine entity manager. Um, in Symfony, it's the other way around. It's shared by default. So you can call set share to false or sh set share to, to true um, to override that. So you can register stuff, uh, an entity manager interface, and set share to false to make a new entity manager every single time you resolve one. Right? Situation number four. Um, for example, you have a file system interface, um, but in different controllers, you have, for example, a photos controller, a PDF controller, um, an image controller, an avatar controller. You basically want all of them to have a type hint file system interface but you want them to point to a different folder. You don't want all PDFs to be mingled up with the Im images and the avatars, etc. So you want the same type hint, but you want to inject different objects. What you do then is something called, or Laravel is calling, contextual binding. And in Laravel, you can bind different objects. Um, for example, container bind, falses, file system photos, file system files, and those can all be file system interfaced objects, right? And then you can define when a photos controller needs a file system interface, inject file system.photos this time. What this does is when photos controller is being resolved and there's a file system interface in the constructor, it's going to use this tag fs.photos or this name to resolve a file system interface from the container, from itself, basically. So the container is resolving the photos controller and it's going to use itself 
to find the fs.photos dependency and inject that. So wherever the file system interface uh, is type hinted in the photos controller could be the first constructor argument, could be the second, could be the, could be the fifth um, constructor argument. But when it's type hinted as file system interface, go look in the container in yourself um, for the fs.photos dependency. And then it's going to use this binding, the fs.photos, call disclosure, get the file system interface to object, and inject that at the correct uh, parameter, um, yeah, if, whether it's the first or the second or the fifth parameter, inject that over there. So this is called contextual binding. Um, the fifth situation is when you are resolving something, but you want to do some extra work. Right? You don't want to just uh, inject a dependency, but you want to use, you want to call some extra methods on it. You want to configure it some more. Um, for example, you have an entity manager from Doctrine, and you want to set up some model listeners. Um, the solution is to use container events or inflection or hooks. Different containers use different vocabulary here. Um, in Laravel, it's called container events. In Lee container, it's called inflection. Somewhere else, it's called hooks. Uh, in Symfony, I think it's called uh, register methods or something. Um, but I'm, go I'm going to show you uh, the example with PHP leak here. In PHP leak, it's called inflection. So we want to tap into the resolving um, the resolving method of the container. So Whenever the container is resolving an entity manager, before you pass on the entity manager to the wherever it's called, wherever it's needed, uh, we're going to do some extra stuff here. And we're going to give it a, an anonymous function which takes, which takes this en entity manager and does some more stuff. Uh, for example, the entity manager, we can get a configura configuration, get the entity listener's re resolver, and register a new model listener. Um, you can do this wherever you want. You don't have to do this wherever uh, when you um, when you new up an entity manager. Could be defined somewhere else. Could be defined uh, in a package that's included with Composer. Doesn't really matter. So you're going to call the container and say whenever someone is resolving the entity manager, do this stuff first and then pass on the entity manager. In Laravel, it's called container events, and you can call it with container resolving. Uh, you don't have to pass in the, the class name because it's going to look at the first argument of the anonymous function, and whenever um, the type matches, it's going to call this anonymous function. I personally use this uh, for injecting some application stuff. Could be the environment, could be a logger, whatever. So. When I type, type in something or uh, implement the environment aware uh, interface, um, I'm going to set the environment interface. Uh, I'm going to set the environment uh, name. So your environment name could be dev, local, staging, production. I'm going to set it in the object because I might need it in that object. So I also have a trait which implements it, and the trait has one method, well, two methods, but one is private. I'm going to set or inject the environment name. Um, and then I'm going to use container events to set the environment name, set env, whenever an environment aware is being resolved by the container. So wherever I implement this environment aware interface, I'm going to inject something from the environment variables. So I'm going to use app env here, get env, app env to inject it wherever I need it. Um, this is useful to quickly inject stuff. I don't need to set this as a constructor argument. I don't need to, um, I don't need to implement this environment method. I can just use um, implement aw uh, environment aware and trade, use trade environment aware. So I just need to adjust two lines and then I have access to the environment variable uh, or the environment name wherever I need it. I don't need to inject a container to see uh, what the environment is. 
Uh, I use this to inject a command bus. I use this to inject an event dispatcher. But this is ju just something personal. If you don't like it, don't use it. It's fine. Um, it's also useful to inject soft dependencies. Um, sometimes when a class has dependencies, those dependencies aren't always used. Um, for example, um, when you have a mailer class, you can use some kind of queue to defer the sending of the email. For example, I don't want to uh, keep my page load slow because I'm sending an SMTP uh, email. Um, I want to put it on the queue and then let it be sent by someone else uh, in, a, in a cron job. I want to process the slow object in a cron job to clear the queue. So I'm using a message queue to send the emails. Um, but this mailer class doesn't always need to use this queue um, dependency. The queue dependency is only used when I use mail queue this email. When I use mail send this email, I want to use it, I want to send the email immediately. So to inject this queue dependency, um, I don't want to inject it in the constructor because then I will need it always, but I want to set some kind of way for the mailer to resolve the queue whenever I need it. So I set a anonymous function. I let the mailer know what anonymous function to call to resolve this uh, to resolve this queue interface object. Um, instead of injecting the constructor uh, the container, I'm sorry. Instead of injecting the container, I'm injecting an anonymous function, which is, it's free. It's, uh, it doesn't take any memory, it doesn't slow down your application, uh, it doesn't make your mailer class dependent on the, on the container. Um, it's just a simple anonymous function which sits there. Um, and whenever the mailer needs to queue something, I can call this queue resolver anonymous function, and I hope it returns a queue interfaced object. So it's useful for injecting stuff like environment name or um, a command bus or an event dispatcher. It's also useful to inject soft dependencies when they're not always needed. And it's also useful to set configurable var values. Uh, for example, um, when I have a validator class, um, and whenever the validator class is, is being loaded, I want to set the allowed file types. This is method injection. I want to set the uh, allowed file types, but instead of injecting the config class into the, the validator, I'm going to set the, uh, the, the allowed file types with this method injection using a container event. Um, so I talked about um, binding, aliasing, um, method injection. But where do we put all this? Um, basically, the answer is it depends. What framework are you using? If you're using Symfony, um, uh, you, can, you can put it in uh, config files. You can put it uh, in PHP files. If you're using anything else, uh, I mean, Zend has its own uh, way of de defining uh, dependencies. Uh, but if you're rolling your own and you're using uh, the Lee container or whatever container somewhere else um, outside of a, a framework, um, you can use this container interop. Remember container interop, container interop, the, 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 the interface for the container? They also have a package called container interop service provider, which is a class you can register. Um, and the class will be called by the container to find all the dependencies. So that's one way to um, put all the dependencies or the configuration into separate classes so they don't mingle up with your uh, application bootstrapping. Um, it's similar to Lee Container. They also have service providers, but they're not interoperable yet. I hope they will be interoperable someday. Um, and Illuminate Container, the, the Laravel container, also has a service provider kind of class. Uh, for Symfony, I s already told you, you can use uh, configuration files, you can use factories. Uh, whatever your framework has, look it up. What's, a, what's the default behavior or the default um, best practice for this framework? 
uh, to put all this binding stuff. Um, right. Um, I thought I thought you about um, binding stuff and aliasing stuff, but now I want to talk about how to use this basically. Right. Um, container is is useless if you're not using it. Just registering everything is not uh, the end goal. The end goal is to use it. Um, preferably, only use a container um, as a service locator. In Symfony, it's called a service locator. Uh, in a couple of situations, could be a factory. Um, a factory is some something that gives you um, a configured object. Um, could be an event dispatcher. Could be a router. Could be a command bus. Basically. Um, in a few different places, and this is what, what uh, unifies all these things, um, they don't know yet what they're going to call. You can configure some event listeners, but you don't know yet, um, you don't have to new up those event listeners. You don't have to new up um, con uh, uh, HTTP controllers in the router yet. Let the router new up the controller whenever it is called. Let the event dispatcher new up a listener whenever the listener should be called. So only in those situations I would uh, prefer to use the container. So to use a container, we can retrieve objects. If you use the PSR11 uh, interface, it has only two methods. Super simple. It has a has method and it has a get method. And the has method returns boolean. The get method returns the resolved object. It's super simple. Um, but most implementations like Laravel, Symfony, uh, Leak, Zend, they all have some more implementation, well, some more details, some more features than these two simple methods. For example, retrieving objects with arguments. Uh, in Laravel, we can do um, container make instead of container get, container make file system. And these are my arguments, images. I can give it an array of arguments, and we can use those arguments to do some more fine-grained uh, resolving. So in the resolving method, we can use args 0, um, which will be images in this, in this uh, situation. And we can use images to point to a different, uh, to a different folder, for example. So when we're we are resolving a file system interfaced object, we can point it to a certain folder. Uh, for example, we can also bind fs.images and use the same container um, to make a file system which points to images. We can also use the container to call anonymous functions. Um, in, leak, in the leak container and in the Laravel container, we can use container call and then give it an anonymous function um, or a closure. In PHP, this can be different things. Uh, the first one in the first one is an anonymous function, so function mailer, and then some function block. The second one is an array. That's also this is also a closure. A lot of people don't know this, but if you give a simple array with two items, the first item is an object, the second item is the method name. Um, this will be the exact same thing as writing an anonymous function. Basically, we're going to call if you use uh, call underscore func call underscore user func, and then pass this simple array with these two items, then we can call this like an anonymous function. The third one is the same thing. Um, listener colon colon handle. Um, what this is, is a static method handle on a listener class. This is the same thing as calling an anonymous function with call underscore user func. Um, so we can use this, uh, and the container will take a look at the function arguments and try to resolve those arguments in the same way as it resolves dependencies of a constructor. So it's going to use um, reflection function, which is the same, uh, the same thing as reflection class, but for a function. And it's going to take callback and take a look at all the parameters. So you can loop over all parameters and see what type hints there are. Um, in Laravel, we can even do uh, container wrap and then give it an anonymous, anonymous function with multiple, um, which can have multiple arguments, and then it will return an anonymous, anonymous function. Ugh, it's a tongue twister. An anonymous function without any arguments. 
So when you call func without any arguments, it's going to call the container. Well, it's going to ask the container to call the wrapped uh, anonymous function. And the implementation is super simple. Wrap, get a callback, wrap it in a new callback without any arguments, and use the container this call callback. Super simple. One more feature I want to talk about is tagging. Um, in Symfony, this means something else than, than in Laravel, so um, I'm going to stick with Laravel. Um, tagging means, in Laravel, um, to give something a tag, so you can use one tag to resolve multiple objects. For example, I want to tag fs.images and fs.pdfs and all other fs.s something with file system. So I can use the container, container tagged file system, to get all the bound, right, the bound objects which are tagged file system. And then I can loop over all file systems, for example, to clear them or to truncate everything. Could be something useful. Let's see, how are we still have 14 minutes, so I'm going to use the bonus slides as well. Lucky you. Um, I want to talk about solving circular dependencies. Can you show me the, the sign again, please? Nope. Um, solving circular dependencies. Um, for example, you have a mailer class, which depends on a queue. Thanks. You have a, and you also have a queue, which depends on mailer. This is a bit tricky. When you try to um, resolve either one of these with the container, the container will say, ah, I'm kind of stuck in a, in a loop here, um, so I need some help. Um, the mailer depends on the queue, and the queue depends on the mailer. One way to solve this is, we've already seen this, is to make one of those two dependencies, convert them into a soft dependency. So instead of having the mailer depend on the queue, having it soft depend on the queue. We've seen this before. Uh, we can inject a queue resolver into the, the mailer. And this way, we can resolve either the queue or the mailer. And when we, when we resolve the queue, it's going to already resolve the mailer and inject a queue resolver into the mailer and inject the mailer into the queue. It's kind of hard to follow, but um, basically, we turned one of the dependencies into a soft dependency, and then it's going to resolve anyhow in any situation. So we can set this up like this. Uh, when we get a, con uh, get a queue from the container, um, it's going to inject a mailer. But before it's going to resolve the mailer, it's going to inject an anonymous function, which can be called. It's not being called yet. It can be called by the mailer when it needs the queue. And then the queue has a reference to the mailer, and the mailer has a reference to the queue. So it's a circular dependency, which is eventually resolved when the, when the mailer needs the queue. It's not being resolved uh, when either one of those objects is being resolved, but it is being resolved as a circular, uh, yeah, as a circle of dependencies whenever uh, the queue resolver has been called. Cool, let's recap. Um, I talked about using a container. You can use any container you like whether it's the Laravel container or the Symfony container or Zend or Aura DI or there's so many containers out there. Um, but I like to use some of the big containers like Leak, Laravel, Symfony and Zend because they have reflection. Reflection allows you to have less um, wiring up. Um, if you use the correct type hands and you don't have too many constructor arguments, you can let the container auto-resolve most of your classes. But um, in most cases, it doesn't work for every single class in your application, granted. Um, you can help the container by binding some stuff. You can bind a, uh, an implementation, like this uh, SMTP implementation, for a mailer interface, and that way you can help the container to auto-resolve everything that uh, has a mailer interfaced type hint in the constructor. We can also call some code uh, with uh, container get or container has. You can also use container call to call anonymous function and automatically inject, inject um, methods argument. And then as a bonus slide, uh, I also showed you how to use um, method injection um, 
combined with anonymous functions to resolve circular dependencies. All right, thank you. I think we have a couple of minutes left for questions. Um, so, um, how do you handle situations in which you need to create some service in the runtime mm -hmm. based on certain input? Um, to give you the idea, what I mean is in uh, typical SaaS applications, you have ca um, customer data that may be stored in different databases or different mm -hmm. servers. And for example, for the DBL service, you need to create it and configure it based on some input, based on the customer that is using your application mm -hmm. at the moment. So, we, so which approach do you use for that? Because um, so, so you cannot uh, predefine that service in the container, right? But you need to so inject uh -huh. it or, or create it in the runtime time in, s in the context of some other service that is supposed to, u to use DBL, that depends on, on DBL. So you, on, you want to inject different stuff based on what's in your database? Is that your question? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, you can wrap that. You can make your own solution, maybe a factory which takes a database. Factory as connection. a service, for example. Yeah, that's possible. Approach. Everything yeah. is possible. Um, okay. I just showed you whatever is possible with a container. You can use the container in a factory. You can make different constructs. Uh, you can use the container inside yeah, but a binding but closure. Yeah, Sorry? But, but at the same time, avoiding service location as an anti-pattern. I don't want to inject the entire container in my service and then obtain database or yeah. Make database. I would only inject layer. a container. I would only inject a container in something like a factory. In something like a factory. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Yeah. You want me to uh, throw it? Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks for the talk. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm Hugo from Sensor Labs. Um, question is, I would like to see. Um, um, information about in Laravel or Leak, do they have sort of um, container compiling and dumping to PHP code? Because as far as I can see, I imagine that the, um, the runtime can be quite expensive if you use uh, the containers like um, Leaks and Laravel. Do they have optimization um, processes for optimizing the container just uh, before um, runtime, before asking for services? Sorry, I, I didn't quite. The question is, do, do Laravel and um, Leak containers have like symphony uh, processes to compile the container, oh, optimize okay. the container, and dump? Yeah. Uh, so symphony has a way to compile all dependencies and store that into cached files. So it's way quicker. Um, I don't think other containers have that. So that's one of the benefits of using symphony, because it's way quicker in production. Um, it takes a bit of setup to use it in development without caching. Uh, but yeah, uh, Symfony has a, a, a big benefit over others um, compared to uh, yeah on the, on the compiled side. Yeah. So on production, it's it's a bit faster using Symfony, yeah. but it takes some setup. Cool, thank you. More questions? Yeah. Yeah. So the reflection API is really convenient, but what do you think about the performance? Is this something that we need to <laughs> worry about? Uh, a lot of people say reflection is slow, but it's actually not. I've run the benchmarks, so it's not slow. It used to be slow on PHP 5, I don't know, 2, 3, mm -hmm. um, but it's not slow. Um, if you really want to be sure, um, go ahead, wire everything manually in, in config files and, and use the Symfony container to, uh, to compile it. But I guarantee you that reflection is not slow. If you set it up correctly, Reflection is not slow. OK, thank you. Next. No one? OK, control it to me. <laughs> All right, thank you.